Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Paul Wilson, Executive Director of Planning and Business Development and International Relations at Index Holding, and a member of DHAB International Scientific Advisory Board, DISAB. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar brought to you by Waterfalls Education in collaboration with DHAB. We are delighted to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Amin Awad, who is a fellow at Harvard University in the USA. Amin Awad is currently engaged as a fellow at the Harvard University on issues related to vital sectors and drivers for economic and social change in fragile states and states in transition. Prior to this, Mr. Awad served in dual capacity as United Nations Regional Refugee Coordinator for the Syria and Iraq situations, and as a director of the Bureau for the Middle East and North Africa of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva. In this capacity, he led the UN Refugee Agency Humanitarian Response in the Middle East and North Africa, coordinated over 9,000 staff and 270 organizations in close partnership with the respective governments, delivering protection and humanitarian aid to some 20 million displaced persons in the region, and in the context of some of the most severe displacement crises of the century. Prior to this, he also worked extensively in the Middle East, including Yemen during the Somali Bolt people crisis in 1992, and in Iraq and Jordan during the first Gulf War in 1990 91. He again worked in the capacity of regional coordinator for the Iraq crisis during the second Gulf War in 2003. Mr. Awad was engaged in humanitarian action with the United Nations for over 30 years, where he distinguished himself in some of the most challenging field operations in the Middle East, Asia, Africa the former Soviet Union and the former Yugoslavia. Mr. Awad also held humanitarian coordinator positions on several occasions, including in Tajikistan, the former uh, Republic of Macedonia and Sri Lanka. I mean, Awad was given the opportunity to contribute to reform and improvement within the United System as a, fo as a focal point for UNHCR. Through this role, he pushed for the UN reform agenda, including the UN transformative humanitarian agenda, as well as in the areas of policy development, field implementation, security sector, and technical areas such as procurement, supply, and oversight. His profound expertise comprises inter alia development cooperation, emergency management, refugee assistance, inter agency coordination, resource mobilization, global supply chain oversight, and political negotiation. Mr. Awad holds a BA in political science and economics and completed higher studies in international development administration. The topic of today's webinar is COVID-19 and the plight of fragile states in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a Q&A button. Uh, feel free to ask questions throughout and we will do our best to ask these questions to Mr. Awad. And there will be a certificate of attendance with the end of the session. So, uh, Mr. Awad, I mean, Awad, welcome to you. I hope you can hear me okay. Thank you very much. I can hear you, Paul. Uh, thank you very much. Good to see you. Good to see uh, you. Thank you very much. I can hear you very well indeed. So, we're going to move to your first slide, and then uh, if you'd like to take us through your slides, um, that would be great. Right. Over to you. Let's go to the first slide, please. Uh, the overview and pre before that i have a couple of things to say just talking about for the states and states in transition uh there isn't really a precise internationally agreed upon uh definition uh for these fragile states or states in transition for regions or states that are considered uh structurally more vulnerable than others uh to in internal and external shocks uh, such as uh, pandemics, economic crises, natural disasters, conflicts, poverty, uh, weak institutions, uh, under legitimate or illegitimate governments. So this is the definition of, of fragile states in the world that where we live today. And uh, by extension, uh, these countries or states, uh, they face problems in delivering. Uh, services, protection, and governance uh, to their citizens. And uh, fragile states also contribute disproportionately, unfortunately, to the world's instability and violence that we see today. So with this background, uh, perhaps I will 
I will talk about COVID-19 and how some of the states are, 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 are struggling uh, with this. Uh, COVID-19, the pandemic arrived in Africa later than many other parts of the world. By then, uh, the, these vulnerable states, uh, fragile states, started to uh, uh, work on locking down this social distancing, uh, stopping international transport, uh, air traffic, interstate travel, uh, the lockdown uh, uh, factories, uh, businesses, uh, and the service sector at large. Therefore, they have faced economic problems before even the pandemic arrived. The COVID-19 is considered a grave global public health emergency, not much for almost a century. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed our globe and brought about severe socioeconomic and health challenges throughout an increasingly fragile world with a speed and magnitude that we have never seen before, which confirms again that the world is inter interdependent and uh, the fragile economies of non-existent functioning health systems compounded the challenges brought about by the pandemic in Africa at large and other uh, fragile states around the world. They, however, there are most affected population groups than others, especially in Africa. And these groups are women, children, elderly, persons with disabilities, and of course, the displaced, uh, whether internally displaced or refugees. The pandemic, the pandemic does not distinguish between the rich and the poor and does not recognize geographical boundaries, as we all know, and keeps remaining, reminding us that no one is independent and that we depend on each other. This is a, a, a corporate responsibility, a social responsibility, a global responsibility for the whole world to really observe. According to the UN, even before the pandemic, poverty prevailed in fragile states where achieving the sustainable development goals, for example, of reducing extreme poverty to 3% of the population by 2030, now that goal seems to be sliding further and further away. Lockdown, as I said, loss of employment and restriction of movement curtailed household income as millions plunged into even deeper poverty in already poor, uh, poor states and almost 300 people are facing starvation by the end of this year because of the economic crisis caused by the pandemic. Massive contraction of labor markets, catastrophic decline of jobs, uh, reduction in remittances by migrants abroad, all contributed to a deterioration in lives and the fortune of the population at large in these states. Many sectors of life and livelihood were affected, including in fragile states, in particular, agricultural based economies, therefore production of food, food security, freight, transport, livestock, storage, supply chain, and normal life. Most of the populations and families in fragile states are dependent on an already unstable informal economy. And with the impact of the pandemic, poverty will double, triple, quadruple in some countries, and particularly among the most distressed and vulnerable population that I've just mentioned some of them. Millions of children, for example, lost valuable schooling terms and remained behind in fulfilling a full or even partial academic year. Impacted communities experience high level of trauma, psychological problems, domestic violence, among other stressors. Distressed and left to fend for themselves, many of the impacted families turn to a negative coping mechanism to survive these economic tough times, from child labor to early marriage to separation and selective belongings and many other measures. Next slide, please. The impact of the pandemic on already fragile health public system, the impact on the fragile health system, it happened because of the economic crisis before the, the, the impact of the pandemic on the health system. More than half of the countries surveyed, for example, by WHO, by WHO uh, which assessed about 103 countries, 
between May and 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 July and July showed that more than half of the country's surveys have limited or altogether suspended uh, outpatient services, community-based healthcare platforms due to lockdowns, restriction of movement, and diversion of resources to the urgent COVID-19 services. In many of the states that are facing the pandemic, most outpatient and inpatient health services were disrupted to deploy resources to the pandemic uh, uh, fight. Next, please. Health totally disrupted, severely curtailed, and uh, uh, many other uh, uh, health problems and difficulties, including non-communicable diseases, diagnosis and treatment, treatment of mental health conditions, management of moderate and severe malnutrition, facility-based birth services, dental services, among many other important and instrumental services. In some cases, hospitals totally closed, not providing any kind of services except for the, the pandemic. Obtaining funds, training equipment and gifts for health personnel, isolation of affected cases, treatment of infected, prevention, public information, campaign, essential responses are all sustained for a long period of time becomes for period of two to two years becomes uh, a challenge for many of these states. Next, please. Some of the countries that one can look at that are facing some of the most difficult time in combating the, the pandemic, but also staying afloat economically is Sudan. Next. Uh, slides please where the country experienced an uprising where a government of dictatorship was overthrown after 31 years in in governance uh the new transitional government although legitimate uh, found that the inflation by the time it took power uh went up uh disproportionately during the first short period of time in the, very, in the period between march to june of the pandemic and uh, from 81% to 112% and uh, the impact uh, of the 19 of the covid-19 uh, also was part of, of of the contribution or the source of this spike in uh, in the in the inflation uh, prices of commodities became out of reach for for most of the population uh, jobs income uh, became a problem and isolated many of the rural and urban dwellers because interstate transport was also curtailed. Uh, the number of infections started to increase, reaching 12,000. It could be three times, four or five times that number because there is no facilities to really do a uh, systematic study uh, type of testing, lockdown and discontinuation of transport, as I said, and closure of international airport, border crossing points, and many of the other activities that will allow health uh, personnel also to move around uh, where uh, we're in a lockdown and disconnected. Lack of equipment, testing material, facilities, tracking uh, system were also not there to help in the fight of the pandemic and therefore contributed to uh, these countries being behind in responding uh, to the crisis. Although in Sudan, we see that the number of cases went down from 300 to 400 a day down to below 100, and that is because of a continuous lockdown for three months, uh, uh, distancing, uh, social distancing and physical distancing. As I said, uh, disruption of transport, closure of international airports, uh, closure of schools, universities, and businesses. Uh, and as a result, and curfews overnight uh, were areas that during times that were uh, considered to be areas where people socialize most or timelines where people socialize most, and that drove uh, the numbers down, but the economy remained fragile. The response of the government uh, to the, con uh, to the uh, COVID-19, while facing also other uh, priorities in the country, uh, remain, uh, remain tough. Next slide, please. South Sudan uh, is a country that is uh, affected by the pandemic and uh, the health uh, system is non-existent to start with. Uh, the overall 
country is more than fragile. There, there are 32 flashpoints. Uh, there is no uh, facilities to test or fight the pandemic except in Juba, the capital. The rest of the counties do not have uh, adequate support. Uh, the falling global crude oil price is negatively impacting the economy. This is a country that inherited uh, uh, an oil crude uh, uh, reserve, and it was disrupted for many years because of the, because of the war. Uh, the presence of over 1.6 million internally displaced persons in crowded camps also uh, makes social and physical distancing impossible. And the presence also of over 300,000 refugees and the economic crisis, uh, the crowding of urban areas, the isolation of rural areas also make that fight against the pandemic in places like Sudan, South Sudan one of the most, if not the most fragile uh, uh, state in the world today. Uh, this new state makes it uh, almost uh, impossible. We move to Somalia. Next page, please. Somalia, uh, like any of the other states I just mentioned, uh, it suffers from attacks on the capital and urban areas. A conflict is continuing. Uh, many displaced people, uh, we are expecting 3.5 to 4 million people uh, to be projected uh, under the, uh, the food insecurity or the food insecurity zone. Uh, poverty, uh, over 3,000 cases, but there are no tests. Uh, we expect 10 times the numbers. And uh, the country also is facing flash floods, deserts, locust upsurge, and attacks, as I said, uh, by many militias in many parts of the country. And that makes Somalia also one of the most fragile states to really sustain uh, this period of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, of, of the pandemic and the peak uh, in the crisis. If you look at the way forward here, next slide, please. Uh, the international and multinational businesses, in particular global brands that can have a powerful impact on changing the situation on the ground for many of these fragile states. We see, for example, the response was swift and effective uh, in many countries uh, and in many parts of the world, especially in some of the very fragile states that I have mentioned. However, coordination between government donors and humanitarian agencies on the one hand was good, but if the private sector and the global international multinational brands was weak or non-existent. If you look at the, at the performance of these companies or multinational corporation and how they integrated themselves in the supply chain in countries in the West or where, where their territories, where they, where they act uh, or where their headquarters and in the neighborhoods uh, where uh, the impacts was felt the most. Uh, these countries have, uh, the next slide please, these organizations or multinational corporations, they have dealt with local communities, organizations, government, businesses, partners, and others, and leverage those connections to channel resources. They have also, like many of the international organizations, had a low start, but, however, very quickly, many of those countries sprang into action to assist public responses to the pandemic. Some adopted their own supply chain to produce uh, personal protective equipment or medical equipment. Others made substantial contribution of funding or putting resources to support uh, first responders and vulnerable population. Many of these efforts took also place through rapidly activated partnership between this the industry, government, nonprofit organizations, and others. I, I, I also reflect on what Jane Nelson of the Corporate Responsibility Initiative at Harvard University uh, gave us on how the private sectors and multinational corporations also, uh, also responded. And uh, 
one of the questions she posed was why and is able to take action in the public interest so quickly, even in the middle or in the midst of all encompassing business crisis that faced because of the lockdown and because of the pandemic. And a review of the private sector response revealed that several key advantages uh, that enhance some companies to be the fairest movers, a number of uh, impediments also left others lagging behind, exactly like what happened in the developed uh, underdeveloped world with humanitarian organization or development organization. And here we found out that coordination was important, preparedness important, the will to have a corporate responsibility initiative uh, to the, to the south, for the South, for the, uh, the, the poorest countries, and also to be able to uh, be united with other organizations, communities, uh, the UN, uh, the private sector locally in the South, but also among themselves as these multi-billion or multi-trillion companies uh, have maybe uh, uh, common areas that they can, they can unite and, and help uh, the nonprofit, the government of the South, and, and provide a huge uh, support. That all depends on innovative, boldly uh, decisions and ability to partner quickly, and also based on established relationship with government and for the broader public good. That's a corporate responsibility uh, that these multi-billion uh, government uh, organizations and businesses were able were able to, to, to provide so far uh, in the north. We're hoping that uh, the way forward, perhaps this can be extended uh, to the south as this pandemic will be with us for a long time, despite the fact that there is a move toward producing uh, vaccines and so on. But uh, we expect another 18 to 24 hour months of, of, uh, of, um, of pressure. So I think one of the uh, most important drivers here would be a well not worked uh, collaborators, leveraging the business relationship, uh, activating philanthropic partnership and community networks with government and organizations, and also uh, be prepared uh, to work in high risk and, 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 uh, and, and areas that are less prepared uh, to match the capabilities that the first, uh, the, 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 the West or the, the, the advanced economies have. Uh, so this uh, actually underline the, the, uh, the, uh, the importance of having a North-South collaboration from the business to the public uh, institutions in the South or from business to business or from business to a humanitarian uh, non-profit organization or even the UN and other agencies that are dealing with the pandemic in the South. Perhaps I'll stop here and look at all uh, some of the questions. Yeah, thank you, Amit, uh, for that uh, presentation. Very informative, very interesting. I don't think we have camera or, on you, so I will uh, um, I'll, uh, ask you a few of the questions, if uh, that's okay with you now. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, how do we, um, we're talking here um, about fragile states. W what's the parameter or how do we define a fragile state in such a, um, a region. Are there certain uh, parameters that you use for a classification in that regard? Yeah, uh, thank you. Very relevant question. Uh, the fragile states that are pre states that are structurally uh, considered more vulnerable than others. And more often than not, uh, observers or uh, entities uh, uh, mix the term uh, fragile with um, underdeveloped uh, failed states or poor states or states in conflict. Uh, that fragile states that are considered structurally more vulnerable than others, and sometimes fragile regions more vulnerable than others, and they're also very weak and open to internal and external shocks, as I said earlier, uh, from poverty to climate change to pandemics to other disasters. Uh, so uh, this is, these are some of the criteria that one, uh, one uses. And uh, also these countries or these states usually with a legitimate government or illegitimate, they fail to 
uh, at times uh, provide for their citizens, be it uh, rule of law, protection, uh, food, health, services in general, uh, and observe people's rights. So uh, these are the criteria uh, that uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, is helping us to, to conceptualize the situation of some of these states. And for a Jari state, as I said earlier in this presentation, also contribute disproportionately to the world's instability and violence. More so that why the world have to really unite to help these states. Uh, if we're talking about multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar businesses, it is important to engage these almost half of the world in these business activities and expand their horizon by helping them to really move from a state in transition, a state fragile state to state in transition, to weather off many of the shocks that uh, these countries need to weather to go on to the next step of development. Thank you, Amin. So we, we talked here a little bit about the, um, the private sector and the contributions from the private sector, and, and at the end, um, the corporate uh, social uh, initiative. If we can, uh, and I understand that the private sector is actually actively trying to get involved in, in certain areas, but for the private sector, they have to channel it through um, certain organisations. Would, would the private sector uh, engage with WHO in this regard? Is the only feasible way to, to push the, the strength of the private sector into a manageable um, uh, environment so the assistance can be uh, managed effectively? Is it only through WHO in this instance? No, not necessarily. The mega multi-billion, multi-trillion dollars uh, entities or businesses, they have a brand. They are, they are needed all over the world. And uh, they have to open up and engage not only with WHO, with the entire UN family. Uh, there are about 50 to 51 program and, and organization, and they offer different services with the private sector uh, in these countries, in these fragile states, uh, in, uh, with the businesses, with the local governments, and with the NGOs, the humanitarian agencies, the development agencies, to really be able to find partnership that's efficient, reliable, with the necessary oversight to make sure that the funds are going where they're supposed to go, whether to the people or the health institutions or the economic uh, issues. Uh, there is a need for a new order that really mega multi-billion, multi-trillion dollars age, uh, uh, businesses can invest during these kind of crises and pandemics in fragile states that I have just sampled some of them uh, to really make sure that the world act in, in, in concert. We are at a time when the world is interdependent. If there is a pandemic, the infection it does not have boundaries. If it goes from fragile states, it goes to the first world. It goes from the first world to fragile states. It goes from north, west, south, east, west, one. And therefore, there is a need for this multi-billion dollars organization to really give another layer of support. We have seen the humanitarian agencies are responding, the financial institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, uh, the donors countries, uh, the development agencies, but that, as we can see, is not enough. This is a pandemic that needs the whole world to be in, in concert. Thank you, Amin. I, absolutely. So, lots of ways to get involved, lots of organizations to get involved with, particularly thinking about the fragile states. How, how do you prioritize in an emergency situation like this right now, with all the, the other factors that you've, you've mentioned from uh, possible um, you know, locusts, floods, conflict zones. How do you prioritize when you start to try and um, assist in these uh, fragile states? Good question. The, 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 prior, the, the, the priorities are competing, but they're linked. Preventing hunger, starvation, that means food, that means nutrition, and also means health. Then, parallel with that, the help these countries to really combat the COVID-19 the COVID through uh, equipment, protective gears, medicine, uh, personnel, uh, funds, 
uh, to really make them uh, transit from this uh, from this uh, phase. Uh, as I said earlier, 300 million people could be facing uh, starvation. This is a priority. Uh, children below the age of five are vulnerable. That's nutrition. Uh, I won't even go to the services uh, that are considered important, like uh, education, for example. But with that, we have to look at the at the very vulnerable uh, other categories of population. Uh, I just mentioned children below five, but there are other children before five, uh, above five, who could be a problem. There's young girls, there are women, uh, there are the uh, the disabled, uh, there are those who are on the move. Uh, caught even during the pandemic in floods, flash floods like in, in South Sudan or Sudan or Somalia. And the same thing applies to many other countries in Africa and Central America and Asia. So there are so competing impediments to really uh, help these countries to stand on their own. And the priorities, they could be from five to 10, but they could be very detrimental and vital uh, to save life. Saving life is very important at this, at this phase. Yeah, reading your uh, presentation earlier, I mean, some of the, the figures are, are really quite scary in terms of uh, the impact that this can have on the population. So, in a sense, uh, before you can mobilise a lot of these uh, programmes, uh, would, would it be fair to say that security uh, and the, um, uh, the looking after all the support of the agencies on the ground has to be at the uh, uh, forefront of this? Security have to be the forefront of this, especially in conflict areas. If you look at South Sudan, yes. Uh, if you look at some part of Somalia, yes. Uh, some part of, uh, of, of Sudan now, the West, Darfur, and other places. Yes, but also what is important and maybe assuring to uh, many of the uh, multinational uh, corporation or businesses uh, that have the ability and the resources, I think number one, aside from security, because they work with intermediaries, I think the most important thing is to have an oversight mechanism to be to have the confidence in the interlocutors that they're going to deal with uh, so that they know uh, their months their money their funds and their resources are going to the right uh, to the right uh, place and it is reported on and put in good in good uh, to a good to good uh, to good use so this is also another important area if we are to um, to engage with international businesses in a meaningful manner. It will take time, will be finding their way uh, slowly. And these are the fears or the concerns or, or, or the obstacles that they may face. Uh, how do they, they, they ensure that their resources will go to the right place? Of course, there are many international organizations that can be the go in between. And there they have already the know-how and the, and the structure to deliver on behalf of uh, donors, for example, now they can deliver on behalf of international businesses. Thank you, Amin. Um, we move now to uh, uh, one of the questions from our audience. Ah, and uh, I, I see you. So I will uh, indeed um, start my video and uh, maybe, I'm not sure people want to see me, but there you go, we can, uh, we can do. We can show the pictures now. So uh, in view of the economic impact that you mentioned, how do we collectively move forward, nevertheless, with the pursuit of the SDGs? Did you hear that question? Yes, I heard it. I think one of the same course of what, as far as the SDGs are concerned, we uh, sit back we reporting that up to 300 million be facing poverty, never had since the beginning of the 90s or mid 90s. Uh, that may represent a setback as far as the SDAs are concerned, but we have to stay the course. And we have to also sometimes put ourselves in the place of fragile state and say how to get around them to twenty thirty. Indeed. Um, also from our audience now, what are the important fields which can push those fragile states to improve their uh, STTES to get out of their fragility? The, 
the credit companies for sure probably fail states. Illegitimate governments perhaps are the difficult ones to really work with. Uh, these are entities that hijacked states, uh, as the case in many other, uh, one of them is Sudan, which I just mentioned. But at least legitimate mm -hmm. government that can play ball with the international community and they're not facing sanctions or isolation. This is where one can focus on few clusters, be it in Central America, in Africa, in Asia, and work with them to really uh, make some progress. As uh, the, the, the pandemic showed us, one of the fastest pandemic we, of our time, very politicized, uh, uh, the exposed the world really weaknesses. It is an interdependent world. If you look at other pandemics, even the SARS not long ago, did not really make the world feel as weak as it is now. Uh, and did alarm world leaders. It did alarm everyone uh, that matters. So uh, therefore they ought to be, we should not wait for crisis to wake us up. We should build a system that will help us collectively to weather off the shocks. And that's maybe the answer as to how we can get these fragile state from where they are to the next phase. And fragile state more than failed states, fragile state under legitimate uh, government or, or authorities have a potential to move on and therefore they should sit on the top of a priority for investment in helping them to be uh, also active states, active member of the international community or the globe, and they have their own resources. Many of these uh, fragile states have incredible resources that are untapped, have uh, uh, in some states, you will find out that uh, some countries have uh, very serene, clean, let's say soil, and Touch for thousands of years, uh, water, agricultural potential, uh, and other uh, uh, benefits that can benefit the world at large. We are facing food crisis, for example, around the world. We have shortage of, of food globally, and it's going to get worse. So investment in countries that have land and water and resources uh, may help also contribute to the globe in closing the food gap and the food security for not only the South or the, 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 the less poor, even rich states are facing problems uh, locating uh, sources of food and, 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 and searching for food security and expansion of areas. So there is a lot to do really when we cooperate South, North, and, and focus on some of these states that have potentials as a first, as a first, uh, as a first uh, priority of some clusters that need help. Yeah, that actually, I mean, I think that kind of links with one of the questions that we have here uh, in terms of uh, food production in Africa. Uh, they specifically mention uh, Nigeria um, and how the uh, the COVID-19 can affect the food production, because I one assumes um, that obviously food moves around Africa. We used to talk about, uh, you know, uh, certain countries being the bread baskets of Africa. So. Uh, is this a factor that some of the less fragile states are going to be affected, which in turn is going to affect the fragile states when it comes to food production? Absolutely, you're correct, uh, Paul. Uh, that's why I say there are clusters of countries have to be looked at as a whole uh, in regional parts. So we have to look at them regionally. Uh, better states than failed. Nigeria is better because it is oil, it is big population. Yes, it is natural resources, but it also was affected because of the close down, the lockdown, and the disruption of economic activities, the transport, the supply chain. Uh, the farmers were affected. The delivery of fuel for farmers, which is very important, was affected. The fact that farmers have to also find their own livelihood was affected. So uh, uh, there are many factors that really lock down the world, and these countries. Uh, took the brunt of it and there is a there is a need to really come up with very emergency uh, uh, oriented type of measures very quickly to reverse this otherwise we will uh, we may get over the pandemic in a year or two or three but the the economic impact will, will remain with us for a long time the first countries that the first state that felt that in a big time is the, are the richest states uh, that have big economic machineries as very difficult to really stop from sliding. Countries that are, are, are poor and already fragile, it hit them hard and hits them to the core, but they can get out of it also very quickly because their economies are not uh, such entrenched globally in a multi 
uh, national kind of uh, of a setting. That's how uh, rich countries or economies are now. They depend on the rest of the world to really survive and thrive. So uh, I think helping these smaller countries with smaller economies with the little money that they need to really help the food machinery and the food security and get them out of health, basic health uh, issues and ills uh, might help us all at the world. Thank you. Yeah, I think this maybe touches a little bit on one of the things we've discussed a little bit before, how, let's say, the, the more developed nations are also having issues. And one of our questions is, uh, how are we going to get the developed world uh, to have a continued interest in Africa uh, as many countries are turning all their attentions inward and perhaps a uh, very little focus on global development. So, yeah, it's something we've touched on before, how maybe for the first time that I can remember, um, it really is everybody's affected, you know, no one's untouched. And that's changed the dynamic, hasn't it, in terms of uh, countries supporting other countries, perhaps. Exactly, Paul. And this is the crux of the matter. This is the whole, my appeal, my whole appeal for the North and especially the rich and multi uh, trillion, uh, multi billion kind of uh, in business entity is to engage. So, to answer your question, I think how the West or the North can get engaged, I've seen the engagement through development, uh, grants. Uh, technical assistance, cooperation, donors and recipients, but I think outright business involvement. In some countries, the government is not the one that is really keeping economies afloat. The business is keeping countries afloat. So perhaps it is time for the businesses to take a bold initiative to also get engaged in a business to business. Through that, there is no, we're not talking about, uh, we're not even talking about, about charity. Maybe through this pandemic, yes, but a business to business, business to governments uh, on equal uh, level uh, will also uplift these countries in transition that are trying to get out of these holes and move to the next, to the next level. So businesses today could play more um, uh, positive we are these countries and make them stand on their own. We should not always think of the traditional. We should think out of the box. Not the humanitarian. It's not the development. It's not the loans. It's not the grants. Businesses can engage uh, with uh, with 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 the South in a meaningful manner. Thank you, Amin. Yeah, uh, I think you're right that uh, there's an opportunity here um, in crisis. Sometimes we, you know, it's hard to talk about it in this respect, but sometimes uh, when, when you force the initiative and you have to look for solutions, you find new solutions. And perhaps there's a way here for uh, the governments and big businesses to come up with some kind of model uh, where it's interesting for businesses to um, uh, collaborate in a different way uh, in terms of the way they manage their finances uh, with these governments. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, there's any solutions on the horizon, but I believe that that's something they could uh, certainly explore. One of the other questions uh, we have, I mean, is, is around these, um, the peace and stability. Um, can you maybe comment on the peace and stability in these fragile states? Um, and how the lack of adequate responses could uh, fuel further conflict. Um, and uh, I'll read the full question. Conversely, if response to the pandemic is handled well, could it solidify confidence and political stability in these nations? So I guess it's going one way or the other, and that, that's difficult to know, I'm sure. Um, more political stability or more conflict? Yeah. It is, it is actually what we are experiencing now. At the beginning, uh, advanced states, middle income states, poor states, we were all struggling with this pandemic. How to respond to it? What is it? Hundreds, I remember at the beginning of this in February, March, January, February, March, hundreds of scientists around the world took to the waves 
and gave different, with a good intention, different analysis, different uh, advice and views. And slowly the world came to know and frame the issues, contextualize them and find out what this pandemic is about to the point where we're almost in the third phase of the production of a, of a vaccine. So there was a lot of trial and errors uh, in the process, hundreds of thousands of people were lost. We are at millions of cases, infections around the world. So, but in areas where there's conflict, the lockdown, the economic impact, which impacted the response to the pandemic, impacted the health system, which means impacted the economy first before the health, before the pandemic. So, uh, differently, definitely the world is coming to term with itself. Uh, how every, every sector depends, impacts on the other. And uh, where there is conflict, the people are there more vulnerabilities. Uh, inherently, services are not functioning because there's a war or a conflict. People are outside their homes in refugee camps or, or internally displaced persons. Uh, host communities outside the country and uh, the list goes on. So conflicts are devastating and, and it's very difficult to. But again, I think stabilization come with availability of resources, competition for resources because of, 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 of tension, because of climate change uh, for these basic uh, sectors. Uh, uh, for example, green pasture for uh, livestock breeders, agriculture and agricultural based economies like you have in South Sudan, for example, herders fighting with other tribes because of water uh, resources or sources, green pasture zone, and that happens throughout Africa and some places in, in Asia also. So that's what breeds, breeds, uh, breeds fighting. And, and if these gaps uh, could be filled, perhaps we may reach a level or a plateau uh, where these, these conflicts are, are reduced and therefore uh, governments or societies can focus more on recovery resilience uh, to really be able to weather some of these shocks, to get these fragile states also. Uh, I won't even talk about failed states at this point, if they're illegitimate, illegitimate governments. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of opportunities to really have another look. We, I think we are lucky to have uh, an opportunity now to reflect uh, what this pandemic did and how we exposed, how exposed we are to an interdependent and interlinked uh, globe. Thank you, Amin. Yeah, and I, I was reading your your report earlier, and one of the things, of course, is uh, is the impact on regular uh, out, outpatient services, um, which is not just uh, in in these states, but of course, the, those services are severely affected when you have a pandemic. The speed with which this. Uh pandemic went around the world and in some uh, from one continent to another, from one town to a village to communities, did really scare the, the health sectors, officials, uh, government leaders, politicians, everybody else. And the obvious thing for them to do at the time was to shut everything down as far as health services are concerned and focus only on delivering uh, services to COVID. 19 uh, patients, suspected cases, testing, uh, inpatient, outpatient, and so on and so forth. And that was, in a way, maybe a mistake. I know of some countries where people were driving, were, were going from one taxi to another, public transport, walking from one clinic, one hospital to the others, and the doors were shut in their face because of errors that the only thing is available is services for COVID-19, everything else shut, no emergency services, no uh, services for children. Uh, women were about to deliver. Uh, I've, I've seen cases where women delivered in buses, in taxis, uh, in front of hospitals, in their home without support. So it really did uh, impact. Now, in some countries that have changed, of course, uh, but the, the services, the health services are supposed to take care of a whole nation or a society was reduced, uh, even, if, if the, even if the code of the protocol was reversed to include other services, a lot of them are uh, functioning with a very reduced uh, uh, level of, 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 of resources, power, uh, hours, and personnel, and everything is diverted to 
uh, the COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a, an, in, an interesting question, uh, it's a slightly different angle uh, from one of our, can it not be said that the fragile states are more immune uh, than other countries on the continent in the light of the marginalization of the continent's countries and their lack of integration into the global system and international uh, exchanges? So in other words, how can we explain the small number of uh, the person who's injured people, perhaps affected people in the fragile states compared to the other countries in the West and, and Latin America? Uh, is that something that you, you, you're you seeing or something that you feel? That yes. they're less affected because of the, the, the environment? Uh, environment played a big uh, big roles of these countries because they are not integrated economically. Uh, they are isolated. There are no jets flying, landing in uh, any countries that has 10, 15, 20 uh, major areas like in the UK, for example, or France, or I won't even mention the US or Brazil. These are bigger countries, but they do not mix, of course, with the outside world as much because economically they are marginalized and they don't have trade. They don't have visitors such and the mode of transport between one area and another also is very maybe primitive uh, on horse bats or, or or other animals or animal carts and therefore the mobility is lower but of course when you come to, to the capitals and bigger towns there is a problem so that's why it also reached Africa later if you look at the traffic between because of businesses and mobility Asia Latin America Europe uh that leaves leaves africa behind in many ways so uh that interaction was 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 a case but yet uh, for those who were hit uh the the quality of the response the speed of it was of course far uh behind what these other continents can offer thank you amin uh one of our questioners would like you to share some thoughts on MSMEs, MSMEs, uh, both international and, and locally, uh, and the coordination of financing beyond ODA, venture capital, uh, philanthropic, uh, and some references on insights in other regions, for example, like Chad or Sahel. Um, did you get that, that question in general? So, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry about my phrasing of some of the things. Yeah. Well, I, the, as far as statistics and trying to 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 contextualize the issues in some of these states that I have mentioned, data becomes an issue. Uh, the full functioning of an economy to really realize many of the indicators uh, and to be captured also. Uh, among the financial institutions to have a, a clearer picture of how these economies function because also maybe they're poorly functioning and therefore data is not generated uh, because of resources. It's very difficult to really uh, contextualize many of these sophisticated uh, ways of, uh, of us uh, talking uh, in economic terms or development terms when it comes to COVID or to development in these, uh, in some of the least developed and in some cases in rural areas, primitive economies that one uh, wants to, to zoom into. Thank you, Amin. Uh, Amin, I'd like you to, uh, if you would comment on the theme uh, next year at DHAD, uh, 15th to 17th of March, uh, uh, 2021. Uh, the theme is aid and coronavirus. Um, focus on Africa. Would you like to give us your thoughts on that theme for, for next year? Yes, uh, thank you very much for raising this. Uh, we had, of course, a debate on this, uh, being board of the, uh, uh, member of the board of DHAD, and I think uh, the series of events that DHAD held over the last few weeks and months on the COVID-19, uh, and particularly in Africa, among others, uh, would be a very good uh, a starting point for the discussion next year. We have collected a lot of information, the world in a better place. And I think the series of events that we had so far sensitize also 
our interlocutors and many of the institutions that are concerned with this. So I think it is a very timely uh, theme, and I think the world will will respond to this and engage, uh, be it uh, uh, governments uh, and others. So uh, uh, I think uh, it's a good that put us in a better place uh, comes 2021, and by then hopefully. If there is vaccine and other developments in countering the, the COVID-19, uh, we're even going to be in a better position to really look beyond the COVID-19 and how the recovery will start uh, uh, after handling the or, or fighting the pandemic itself. There will be a lot of uh, multiplier effects that we have to be uh, looking at. Thank you, Amin. Well, time flies. Uh, as you know, and um, I'm going to give the last uh, word to you, but I'd just like to thank you for your time uh, that you spent with us this afternoon. Thank you for all your uh, wisdom and insights into what's going on, uh, particularly in Africa and the, and the fragile states in, in Africa. I'd like to thank uh, DHAD uh, for uh, its support and DISAB, of course. I'd like to thank all our participants. And again, it's always difficult to ask all the questions, but we've, we've done our best best to put some of those questions to you. So I'd like to thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's good to see you looking well. And um, I'd like to leave the last word to you. Um, and I'd like that word to be uh, a message to the humanitarian community, uh, your uh, uh, fellow friends and uh, co-workers and, uh, in the humanitarian community, if you would. Thank you very much. I think I will echo what I've said earlier. Uh, my fellow humanitarian uh, community, uh, practitioners, managers, frontline women and men who find themselves uh, doing the job, but adding a very big uh, part of, uh, of, of, of the COVID-19 fight to their portfolio as the UN and humanitarian agencies at large launched a lot of appeals and they, be, and they had the COVID-19 at the center stage of their work and their mandates. I think yet, uh, I would say at the field level, uh, they should engage with the business uh, uh, sector and they should urge their headquarters also to engage with the top five uh, countries, per companies perhaps, perhaps in the world, to really engage with the fragile states and states in distress that are facing such pandemic, shortage of food, uh, disruption in agriculture and livelihood and sources of income. And I think that at the, in the long, in the short term, mid term or long term will benefit uh, these entities also. And I think we have to really focus all our efforts, uh, put all of our weight, uh, all of our resources into really uh, 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 getting to this, what I call last frontier, in really in global uh, philanthropy from the North reach to the South, but also with this multinational corporation that can also benefit. Uh, from these smaller states through business, but first through the fight of, con uh, of COVID-19 and restarting some of their economic activities. Thank you, Amin. I think your message is very clear. It's a, a very practical um, uh, uh, message in order for people to move forward and, and take some action. So once again, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. And um, I just wish you a wonderful evening and uh, all the best with all your endeavours. Thank you so much, Ami. I thank all the participants and you, Paul. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.